Today is Good Friday, and of course, um, in two days we'll be celebrating Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. And uh, there's folks celebrating and commemorating uh, this special time all over all over the world. And and even this week, there are folks that made special pilgrimages all the way to the Promised Land or the Holy Land, uh, so that they could see uh, Jerusalem and be there uh, to worship. Uh, during this Holy Week and Easter Sunday. Uh, Sunday's probably going to be the highest attended um, Easter, uh, and probably in, in, in at least a couple of years, right? Because even last year, people were still hesitant because of the uh, pandemic. So I think Sunday across the globe, there's going to be a very high attendance uh, this Easter. And so it's a little ironic. Uh, I titled my message this evening, Three Reasons to Stay Away. Uh, from Jesus, okay? And I'm not trying to be controversial or, or provocative in the title. Uh, I'm trying to, of course, help us to think through uh, who Jesus is and really question if we want to have anything to do with him. He himself said, uh, let's count the cost, right? Don't put your hand to the plow and look back. And there's been some time since the crucifixion, since the life of Christ uh, in the regions of Galilee and, and Samaria and, and Judea, ending in, in Jerusalem. And there's been a lot of folks uh, claiming to know and to follow Jesus. And it just seems that having such a long time, uh, 2,000 plus years since those events happened. And because of the, the kind of culture that we live in, it's easy to say that you're a friend of Jesus or that uh, you believe in Jesus, but at the same time, have a Jesus that is quite similar to your uh, desires, to your goals, um, to your culture, to your likes, to your dislikes. It's very easy this day and age, to have a Jesus that's almost just like you. We've made Jesus into our own image. If you look across the landscape of the churches in America, and if you listen to interviews on, on news and on TV, and you hear people talk about Jesus, some of the things you hear might make you nod in agreement, and other things make you kind of scratch your head. Is that what Jesus is like? Would Jesus condone that or uh, do that kind of thing, believe that? And so in this day and age, it's very easy or very possible uh, for there to be a woke Jesus, if you want a woke Jesus. There could be a John Wayne Jesus or a Mr. Rogers Jesus. There could be a guru Jesus. There could be a Jesus of the left, a Jesus of the GOP, a prosperity Jesus, a sublime Jesus. And so really, it would appear then that you could take, take your pick of the Jesus that you want to follow. But the real Jesus quite stubbornly refuses to give in to who we think he is ought to be. The real Jesus stubbornly refuses to conform to a false image of Jesus. And so I think it's probably better or more authentic of us if the real Jesus doesn't quite fit into our mold or to our pattern or to our likes or our dislikes to our wants, to our goals, to our dreams, then it would be far better, I think, for us, like some of the folks we're going to be talking about tonight, to have nothing to do with them. It would free us up. It might ease our conscience a little bit. So I want to offer three reasons why it might be a good idea to stay as far away as possible from Jesus. The first one 
uh, is that Jesus is bad for your bottom line. Jesus is bad uh, for your bottom line. Now, one of Jesus' disciples taught us this or, or, or teaches us this. It's, of course, uh, Judas Iscariot, uh, one of his disciples, one of the twelve, and, and one uh, we know uh, that betrayed the Lord. The Bible says that the money, money is the root, the love of money, excuse me, not money, the love of money is the root of all evil. And Judas Iscariot perfectly illustrates this, right? He had a special job amongst the disciples. What was it? He was the, the treasurer. He was the, the, the keeper of the purse. And we, we, we shared a couple weeks ago, if you were hearing a sermon about uh, Jesus eating with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Do you remember Mary came and she poured out at Jesus' feet this very costly perfume, this ointment, nard, imported probably from India, very expensive, a year's worth of, of, of wages for a day laborer. And Jesus says something interesting about that in Matthew 26, uh, verse 13 and 14. He says, truly I say to you, whenever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in her memory. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests. You see the correlation? Jesus is the one that voiced what a lot of folks there were thinking, that what is she doing wasting this per expensive perfume at the feet of Jesus, of course, we could have sold it and given that money to the poor. But the Bible uh, hints us into what he was actually uh, feeling, right? It says in John chapter 12, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And so just like that, when he realized, and I think that was a turning point for Judas, that moment when Jesus praised Mary's response or Mary's actions and said that whenever this gospel is preached, her name is going to be remembered. What she did is going to be remembered. Her lavish uh, gift is going to be remembered. What, that's when Judas, the light came on and he realized, I was using Jesus as a means to wealth. And Jesus is now a stumbling block to me using him as a means of wealth. And so what did he do about it? He went to the chief priest and betrayed his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Now, Again, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. The Lord doesn't begrudge anybody for having wealth. We're not expected to, uh, you know, live out on the street with no material means whatsoever. The problem comes when we see that Jesus is a means to earthly wealth. When we use Jesus as a means to our own prosperity, into our own gain. That's what Judas realized. This isn't happening. And so I got to betray him. I got to let him go. I got to leave Jesus behind. I got to do away with him. I got to stay away from him. And so if you, if you believe that Jesus is a means to wealth, to prosperity, to anything and everything you ever wanted in this life, I'd caution you against following Jesus. Many a ministry has been shipwrecked and put a black eye on the name of, of our Lord in Christianity because of manipulating congregations and, and, and gullible 
people into pouring and, and giving because they believe not so much that they may be giving to Jesus or to a ministry, but what they're being told is if only they give more, what? They're going to they're gonna get. It's to name it, claim it, grab it, blab it, whatever. We got to be careful. Jesus is not a means to earthly wealth. So if that's your Jesus, reconsider your Jesus. Another re reason why we might want to stay away from Jesus is uh, Jesus could be bad for your health. Peter was a family man. One of Jesus' first um, miracles was healing Peter's mother-in-law. And as a family man myself, I know that we want to do our best and to work hard to provide uh, security and uh, well-being and safety for our families. And I think Peter... Could you imagine all he witnessed, all he, he partook in, all he experienced by following the Lord? He saw the miracles. He saw the people healed. In fact, he was bold enough at one point to step out of the boat, you remember, and, and he was walking on water because Jesus told him he could. And then he, he started to waver in his faith and he started sinking. But what happened? The Lord grabbed him and lifted him up in the boat. He had his back. He provided healing for his mother-in-law. He saved him from his own uh, drowning at, at this, at this uh, miracle when he lifted him up out of, the, out of the sea. Jesus could protect us from anything, from disease and even death. He was there. He saw Lazarus rise from the tomb. He saw Jairus' daughter come out from the tomb. There's nothing that this Jesus can't do. I'm safe and I'm secure and we'll be okay with Jesus. We'll be safe. We'll be well. Matthew 26 verses 51 through 56 gives us this account. It says, And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and that he will uh, at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets must be fulfilled. Then look what happened. Then all the disciples left and fled. Jesus, Peter said, remember, Jesus had told Peter, about what was going to happen after Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but our father in heaven. And then Jesus started talking about this very thing. He was going to be betrayed and he was going to be uh, tried and he was going to be crucified and, and he was going to be buried. And, and what did Peter say? No, that's not going to happen. He was in denial. And here, at this very point, at this very moment, the light bulb, like it did for Judas, the light bulb went on. And he said, hold on a second. I tried to defend you, and you, you're stopping me from doing it. You're telling me not to do it. And if you're not going to defend yourself, that means you're not going to defend us. I'm out of here. But he kept watching at a distance. And paying attention to see if maybe, hopefully, he was wrong. That Jesus would, at the trial, do away or, or, or exert some kind of power and, and influence and, and be done with all this uh, hurt and all this pain and agony. But it wasn't going to be so. And what happened? 
You, you're a Galilean. You're a follower of Jesus. No, not I. I don't know the man. The man I knew wouldn't be allowing this to happen. Why is Amy protecting us from this? And so we see that Peter realized that the true Jesus doesn't always provide safety and protection and make sure that we're healthy and well. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not healed. You're not better because you lack faith in Jesus. That if you only had a little bit more faith, that you'd be well, that you'd be healed, that, that you wouldn't be sick. Jesus, Jesus doesn't heal everybody. Jesus doesn't, doesn't keep bad things from happening in our lives. And if you're counting on him to do that, to save you from every danger, to protect you from all harm, to cure all your sicknesses, then again, like Judas and like Peter, you should question your association. Third reason that we might want to stay away from Jesus is because Jesus is bad for your reputation. Pontius Pilate was a Roman procurator. He was governing the region of Samaria, Judea, and Idumea. This territory originally was in the hands of Herod Antipas, his oldest brother, but was taken away from him and placed in the hands of Pilate because Antipas's brother couldn't keep the peace. And so it was very clear what Pontius Pilate's role was in that region. He was to be a keeper of the peace. And it wasn't an easy job, but that was his job description. And there was fights between the Jews and the Samaritans. Even amongst the Jews, there was this faction and that faction. There was this sect and that sect. And there was always arguments and there was always uh, folks trying to come up against the Roman Empire and overthrow and, and one riot after another riot. And so he had a hard job. He wanted nothing else but peace and uh, influence in that, in that region. He wanted things to be calm. He wanted to be good at his job. But this latest outburst we read or we, we, we've read uh, from the account, it was different for Pontius Pilate, wasn't it? He saw in the face of Jesus, in the countenance of Jesus, not an insurrectionist. Uh, he didn't see in the face of Jesus someone who was trying to, to trouble, uh, stir the waters, muddy the waters, someone who was trying to, to cause uh, a problem. He saw in his face uh, the face of a, not an agitator, not a rebel, but the eyes of a sage in the spirit of, of peace. And so what is he going to do? Shouldn't I let this man go? He's obviously done nothing wrong. In fact, he's barely said a word to defend himself. Let him go. No, crucify him. Crucify him. Well, there's Barabbas. Barabbas here, he's a murderer. He deserves everything that he's getting. Jesus is innocent. He, he's obviously pure. He hasn't done anything wrong to deserve this punishment. I'll give you Jesus and we'll condemn Barabbas. No, give us Barabbas. But what about Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And there's Pilate. When he saw that there was no way that Jesus was going to be able to bring him influence or peace, and that the only way that Jesus was going to bring peace in the moment was to go ahead with the crowd,
He sent him to the death. Via crucifixion. And he washed his hands. At his death, those that stood by him were scarce. Very few identified with Jesus. Why? Well, at his death, he was poor, he was persecuted, and he was powerless. This is the exact opposite of what is esteemed and what is desired in our world. Of course he was alone. Of course he was abandoned. And again, I say, if you want, and if your heart yearns to be satisfied materially or be guaranteed peace and security or have influence and power, you do well to question your association with this man. Jesus is not what we want because in our sinful nature, we can't want him. And most of the time, like these men, we don't have a hard time showing it. The thing about it is that Jesus came to change our wants. Jesus came to change our hearts. One of his last words on the cross was, Father, what? Father, forgive them. Why? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. This statement implies, right, that if there was this missing piece of knowledge, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. In other words, if they only knew this, they wouldn't be doing this. If only their hearts and their eyes were open, they wouldn't be doing this. They'd realize what they were doing. They wouldn't do this. I think it's important for our preconceived ideas about who Jesus is to be destroyed, to be uh, obliterated, because only then are we in a place to take Jesus for who he truly is at face value. And up until the crucifixion, right, the story of Jesus could be a tragedy. It would be a tragedy. He wasn't the only one preaching uh, a message in Jerusalem and Judea. We don't know the names. We don't have a record of all the ones that went preaching and teaching uh, in this area of, of the world. More than that, like I said, he died. He didn't, he didn't have a, a, a large uh, family. He didn't have a large inheritance. He didn't have territory. He didn't have land. And so, really, his story up until this point is a tragedy. But Sunday's coming. But the resurrection, the resurrection authenticates the life that Jesus lived. The resurrection validates a Jesus kind of life. If not for the resurrection, we'd be well to to spurn it, to, to turn our backs to it, to ridicule it, to mock it. But the resurrection, Jesus is alive. And the thing about it is, Romans 8, 11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. In other words, Jesus gives us his resurrection power His life is alive in us. His life. The Jesus kind of life. The only life that's worth resurrecting at all. 
The type of life that we shun is actually the only valid way to live. Jesus' passion is a blueprint of our lives. The quality of our life is not one measured in wealth and health and power, but in yieldedness to the will of God. With the resurrection comes the freedom to not live for these things, but to live for God. And so to Judas, we'd say, Judas, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? To Peter, we'd say, Peter, don't fear those that could harm and kill the body, but fear the one that could put both body and soul in hell. With the resurrection, we have the power to surrender these wants at the cross, to surrender our desire to, to, to control and to, to feel like uh, we need to own everything, be protected from everything, have influence over everything, to seek submission to God's will, to seeking our own to seeking the welfare of others, from seeking spiritual, uh, from speak, to seek spiritual wealth instead of financial wealth. And the Jesus kind of life is a life uh, free from the fear of death to freedom and to true life. Jesus is risen. And he promises that you too will experience his kind of life if you would dare to take him at his word. Come, follow me, take up your cross daily. I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What are you trusting in? What's your hope in? What are you relying on? When it's all said and done, what's the meaning of your life? Listen to the words of Jesus. Listen to the call of Jesus. Come follow me, he says, and I will make you fishers of men. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather together.